How worried should we be by the rise of Hindu nationalism in the world's biggest democracy? I'll ask one of India's best-known politicians, Shashi Tharoor. I'm Mehdi Hassan, also on the show. With parliamentary elections in Turkey less than a month away, is President Erdogan cracking down on dissent and encouraging a cult of personality? That's our debate. But first, he's a former UN official turned Congress party minister, a best-selling author with more than three million Twitter followers, a parliamentarian hounded by the media since the alleged murder of his wife. Shashi Tharoor is one of India's most talked about politicians. So with nationalist and religious violence on the rise and with a Muslim man lynched for eating beef by a far-right Hindu mob, is India heading down a dangerous path? This week's headliner, Shashi Tharoor. Shashi Tharoor, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Pleasure to be with you, Mary. The subtitle to your best-selling book, The Elephant, The Tiger and the Cell Phone, is Reflections on India, the Emerging 21st Century Power. Can a country in which almost half the population still struggles to make ends meet, lacks access to basic services, the world's largest illiterate population is there, can such a country really be described as a 21st century power? No, it can't. And that was a subtitle of the American edition. I objected <laughs> after I saw it, but it was too late. In fact, one of my notorious comments after that is how can we be a superpower when we're still super poor? We have enormous challenges. The Indian subtitle was somewhat more innocuous. Uh, I will say, however, that the country has tremendous potential. Well, on the political level, in your books, in your writings, uh, in your public speaking, you speak a great deal about India being a democracy, about being a thriving, uh, pluralist, liberal democracy. But what do you say to someone like Arundhati Roy, the famous Indian novelist, who argues that India is actually moving away from democracy and actually towards a form of fascism, a form even of totalitarianism, that she says your country's been taken over by uh, nationalist elites, corporatist elites? Well, the very fact that she can say all this and say it in India suggests that she couldn't entirely be right. The fact is that there are forces in our country who are illiberal and we need to resist them. And there are people like me who do. I think denouncing the entire system is actually not a useful way of tackling these problems. Within the system, there's a tremendous, lively, positive debate. And we can stoutly oppose the illiberal tendencies without saying the entire system is bad, it isn't. You've, you're the chairman of the Indian Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee, yeah. uh, a former Minister of State for Foreign Affairs. Uh, yet you've said in the past that you don't want to criticise your government's foreign policy. You've said, even though you're a member of the Congress Party of the Opposition, uh, you've said that for you, politics stops at the water's edge. Does that apply even when your government is headed by a leader, BJP Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who many believe was involved in crimes against humanity in Gujarat when 2,000 Muslims were massacred on his watch? Well, I was one of those whose voices were raised against Mr Modi for many years. But it is true, number one, that he hasn't been convicted by any court, hasn't been found guilty even by association yet, uh, and therefore we can't really speak of him as being culpable. And second, that he has won an enormous mandate from the Indian electorate. And that in every democracy is a kind of absolution as well. So I'd rather focus on Mr. Modi, the prime minister, what he's doing today, what he could do tomorrow, rather than worry about the past. It is a blot. But if you're the be victims held of a massacre him. in Gujarat, that's not the past for you. You I want accountability, you, you I, want justice. I agree. You say he hasn't been tried. Are you someone who thinks he should be tried? The Supreme Court's amicus curiae said there was a case for him to answer in court. Others disagreed, of course. That's right. And the point is that ultimately the judiciary decides who's going to be uh, considered. So you have no view on culpable. it? Culpable. Well, no. I mean, I, I haven't done as much, obviously, to look into it as the investigative team, the amicus curiae, the lawyers on both sides. And they both made very compelling arguments. To my mind, the fact is they were victims. The victims suffered horrendously. And for us to be indifferent to their plight is impossible. The question is who's responsible, and we have to wait for the judicial system to There's establish There's been that. a discussion uh, in India, especially since the last election last year when Mr. Modi won his big victory, about the rise of so-called Hindu nationalism, Hindutva, about communal rhetoric. Uh, recently, a Muslim man in the state of Uttar Pradesh was murdered. He was lynched uh, by a Hindu nationalist mob for allegedly eating or keeping beef 
beef in his house. Uh, some would say that the Congress Party hasn't spoken up loudly enough, vocally enough. People like yourself who are the secular liberals, where are your voices in this debate when the country is supposedly heading in this reactionary well, direction? It so happens that Parliament is not in session, so we couldn't use that forum, which we would have. But we've all spoken in the public space to the press, on television, on Twitter, in my case, and social media. Uh, so we've made our voices heard. There's no doubt about that. Rahul Gandhi, the, the vice president the of the party, has been to the family home, met the and family. And yet the Congress party is saying now is the time we should support the BJP government and have a ban on beef. That sounds like you're pandering rather than challenging. No, I mean, I, I must say that was a statement by one Congress leader. Uh, we haven't got to that point yet. But the, my argument... Is that argument, something you support? No. My argument has throughout been that what you or I choose to eat is an intimate personal decision and it's nobody else's business what we do. I happen to be vegetarian, but I have absolutely no problem with anybody in my but, home but this consuming is not, anything they want. And this is a particular example, but there are many, many other examples that NGOs and human rights groups have raised. Are you worried? See, the criticism seems to be of you is that you're someone who's come from the UN, you're someone who styles yourself as a liberal, as a secularist. Why aren't you angry? Why aren't you passionately leading campaigns? Campaigns. India is heading in a dangerous direction, as many would say. Do you think it's heading in a dangerous I, I direction? I do, and read me, Mehdi, and you'll see that you know, each of us has our own strengths. Some are better off doing this on the street. Some of, some of us are better off doing it uh, in the written uh, space and on television. I've been doing precisely those But you've also got in trouble on the written space yeah. in that you praised Narendra Modi's cleanup campaign last year. You lost your job as a Congress Party spokesman for praising the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. You tweeted happy birthday to Mr Modi. You said you admire the fact that he leaves positive impressions wherever he goes. Many say, well, why are you cozying up to this man if he's so dangerous? He may be responsible for bloodshed. All right, let's take those one by one. The Clean India campaign, when the Prime Minister of your country invites you to associate with him in a non-political enterprise, it would seem churlish at the very least to say no. And nobody else did. He invited everyone from Sachin Tendulkar to the movie actor Salman Khan and Priyanka Chopra, and, and I was one of those nine. Are you holding your political standards to standards of Bollywood stars? Is it's that not, really your standard? It's, no, that's not the point. The point is, here is an objective, a clean India, that goes back to the days of Mahatma Gandhi. The first sanitation campaign in India was but led the by the Congress Party government. impression suggests that you're not as anti him as you should be, if you believe that he's a dangerous figure. If that's what you believe. It doesn't seem to be the case I have in your said, I have said interaction. When the Prime Minister says the right thing, I will acknowledge it. But you are worried to take the bigger point about the direction India is going in. You're not someone who's complacent about where India is going. Not at all complacent. Beaches. I believe there is rising intolerance. I believe the Prime Minister, through his silence, has condoned some outrageous statements and ideas by his ministers, in some cases, by political party leaders <coughs> of his party. And I believe that he... While well, he himself has so far not said the wrong thing, his silence too is tantamount to not saying the right thing. And that's something that, as a prime minister, he can be held accountable. He invited you to join a clean-up campaign and you said it would be churlish to refuse. If he invited you to join his government, would you accept? Well, he wouldn't and I wouldn't accept. Never. You rule out ever well, look, serving in a BJP or Modi-led government. We have a parliamentary system. And in our system, as in the British system, but perhaps not in the American one, where I do know that they've been cabinet members from other parties, in our system, you belong to a parliamentary majority or to a parliamentary opposition. I'm in the parliamentary well, opposition. Let's talk about your parliamentary opposition. You're a Congress Party politician. We spoke about the BJP's record in Gujarat. You talked about the Prime Minister's silence. It's not as if Congress governments were immune from ethnic or sectarian or communal violence. Plenty well, of riots under Congress chief ministers, Congress government. There have been riots, unfortunately, throughout um, in every part of India under every sort of government. But there's one big difference. The Congress Party has never been accused of inciting one or seeking to profit from That's one. That's not true. In, in the no, 1980s, absolutely. Congress Party politicians the, led pogroms against Sikhs the Sikh, after the assassination after of Indira Gandhi. You know that and I know that. And that is the one exception that I personally condemned That's at the time. That's a big exception. It is. But what we're talking about with the BJP, as I have, I have publicly stated, is that there are elements in the BJP who are deliberately inciting communal violence in order to benefit from the political polarization that they hope will ensue. In other words, that it's a way of rallying majority Hindu opinion behind them or enough of it to win elections. And to our mind, that is absolutely unforgivable. You attract a lot of attention as an Indian politician. Uh, the media is obsessed with your every move. The only Indian politician uh, at one stage, I think the Prime Minister was behind you in the number of Twitter followers. You have several million followers on oh, Twitter. He overtook me in 2013. He overtook you. So. Well, you're, you're obviously keeping a close eye on it. Why do you think you attract so much attention from the press and the public in India? 
Look, I have absolutely no idea. I, in Twitter, I was frankly one of the early adopters. And as a result, uh, because I was tweeting at a time when our media didn't particularly welcome anybody bypassing them and going directly to the public, I guess I got a fair amount of unwelcome uh, attention for my tweets. Subsequently, the media themselves have seen Twitter as a source they can mine. And they themselves, the major media figures in India, are on, on social media as well. So the atmosphere has changed. And Mr. Modi certainly has been using it extensively and quite effectively. Why I get attention? You folks who give me the attention will have to explain it. Well, some would say that Twitter uh, has helped you in terms of building your profile, um, but it's also hurt you as well. Uh, your late wife, Sunanda Pushka, took to Twitter to publicly suggest once that you were having an affair with a Pakistani journalist. And suddenly, everyone in India is looking at your Twitter account and following all of your private life via Twitter. Well, I think I was being followed before that happened. But that was a pretty case. big moment. That, that, that was a very sad moment. My wife was not a well woman, and she passed away within a few days of, 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 of all of that. So it was a painful episode, and I'm not sure it's typical of anything else. Uh, either in my life or, or, or in that and it particular was a, experience. And I'm sure it must have been a very painful episode. Uh, she was initially thought to be suicide. And then in January of this year, the Delhi police deemed it to be a murder case, which I can't imagine what that must have been like for you in terms of... Pretty awful. ...stressfulness, it? indeed. You're an ex-diplomat at the UN, you're an ex-minister, you're a best-selling author. And yet today, these days, most of the focus on you centers on what may or may not have happened to your late wife. Well, what the police like? are still trying to establish whether it was a murder. I think technically that's, that's what the investigation is trying to do right now. Obviously, everybody in the family would be very concerned, even though none of us believes. And when I say none of us, I include her brothers and her son, uh, who are the, the immediate family members other than, my, other than myself. And none of us believes that this, this could possibly have been that. We knew she was not well. She'd been seeing multiple doctors. But if there is a basis for making such an inquiry, uh, we've been waiting almost two years for that inquiry to come to a definitive conclusion. And so far, there hasn't been one. And you're a newcomer to the kind of rough world of Indian politics. You have, you're not a lifelong Indian politician. You Far come from, from the UN. Yeah. I mean, in India, after this happens, one of your political rivals suggests that you know who the murderer of your wife is. Another goes on TV and says you murdered your wife. The police say that you're not a suspect in the case. How do you deal with accusations like that? Well, there's a tremendous amount of irresponsibility around the media. And, uh, you know, either one has the option of suing these people or of ignoring them and unbalance the old adage that, you know, there's no point wrestling in a mud pit with a pig because, you know, you get down to the pig's level, the pig enjoys being in the mud, you and you just get... come out getting dirty. I don't believe anyone would have any reason to murder my wife. I don't believe there was a murder. But as long as the possibility of one is being you investigated... You must want to know if there is someone exactly, out there. If, well, uh, you know, it's impossible, but if there was one... You think of, it's impossible? You don't accept even... Well, I mean, uh, you know, no one has given a convincing reason for believing... So why are the police doing this? Because, unfortunately, there, a... there was a, 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 a forensic report that speculated about poisoning without any evidence explaining why that speculation was offered, largely because if there had been any evidence, it would have emerged by now and we would have seen some progress in this matter. It's a rather protracted investigation. We're waiting for it to conclude. And really, I don't have much to say until that happens. OK, we'll have to leave it there. Shashi Toro, thank you very much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. Inequality is a myth. We've heard that one before, and despite almost every indicator suggesting it's spiralling out of control, some are still in denial. The truth is that we live in a world where 85 people own more wealth than the poorest 3.5 billion people on the planet. Let that stat sink in for a moment. That's half the world's population owning as much as a group of people you could fit onto a double-decker London bus. Think that's bad? In Africa, the poorest half of the population owns as much wealth as the 10 richest individuals who could comfortably fit onto a Kenyan Matatu. Not that they'd ever choose to travel by Matatu, of course. The picture isn't much better anywhere else. And all in all, about one in five people on this planet still has to live on less than one dollar a day. Compare those people to Mexican billionaire Carlos Slim, one of the world's richest men. If he were to spend one million dollars every day, it would take 211 years for his money to actually run out. I do hope the poor guy has a pension plan. So, rising inequality is a fact. But is it a problem? Doesn't all that wealth eventually just trickle down from rich to poor? 
Well, not quite. Best-selling economist Thomas Piketty says the consequences of rising inequality are potentially terrifying. Nobel Prize-winning economist Joseph Stiglitz and Paul Krugman aren't fans either. I know what you're thinking. Piketty, Stiglitz, Krugman, they're just lefties, fear-mongering and fueling class war. But wait, what's this? Bill Gates, the world's richest man. The head of the OECD. Even right-wing US Republicans. And of course, those communists over at the International Monetary Fund. Excessive inequality is actually bad for sustainable growth. Got that? Growing inequality isn't just morally grotesque, it's bad economics. It's bad for your bottom line. The truth is that we simply can't afford to carry on living in a world divided between the have-nots and the have yachts. The person who wrote this story will pay a heavy price for it. I won't let him go unpunished. That's what President Erdogan told a newspaper editor in Turkey in May. As Turks go to the polls for a second time this year on November the 1st, has their president gone too far in cracking down on dissent and on press freedom? Supporters say he's being unfairly maligned, but journalists have been sacked, detained, jailed, while Erdogan's critics refer to a new cult of personality. Joining me in the arena to debate this are Zeynep Jane Kandor, a member of the AK Party, former vice president of the Women's Branch, and a journalist with the Daily Sabah newspaper. I'm also joined by Mustafa Akyol, award-winning author and columnist for Hurriyet Daily News. He used to be an AK supporter, but now thinks Erdogan is running an authoritarian regime. Thank you both for joining me in the arena. Uh, Mustafa, you were once an admirer, a supporter. You voted uh, AK. What makes you now describe them as an authoritarian regime, an intimidating party with an unquestionable leader bent on domination? Your words about Mr. Erdogan and AK. My principles did not change. I think Mr. Erdogan and his political narrative and his political model changed. Uh, Erdogan did great things for Turkey. Uh, he came to power in 2002. He was a conservative Muslim believing in liberal reforms and democracy. And he headed for EU and he liberated and the economy minorities, grew. economy grew. But now, what's your objection now? What happened is that the more Mr. Erdogan dominated the political system, the less he got interested in reform, he got more assertive about his moral values and bringing them to public space, which is debatable. But more importantly, in the past two years, since the big Gezi Park protests, he started to define a position as nefarious spies, traitors to the nation that are trying to undermine the country. Instead of being just his opponent, they become traitors to the nation. And Mr. Erdogan is using this narrative powerfully. There's a whole media machine that is pumping this paranoia. Well, in my view, paranoia. Plus... And what uh, about his critics? Well, the critics are there. So Turkey is not North Korea. You have opposition papers. But for some reason, they're being suffocated. For some reason, they're getting incredible tax fines. Newspapers are changing hands. Some people... Buy Journalists news. are being arrested. Journalists are being arrested. Sacked. Not all of them is directly related to Erdogan, but... Six papers changed hands over the past six years. They were bought by Mr. Erdogan's friends. When and President they, Erdogan says, nowhere in the world is the media as free as it is in Turkey, that's a joke, isn't it? Well, that is not factually correct. <laughs> let, let, well, let, right me bring in, let me yeah. bring in Zeynep Cenk Kandor. Uh, is it the freest place in the world for the media under President Erdogan? There are certain restrictions at the moment on media press, which it must be kept remembered that what's happening in Turkey is that there is a... a terrorist insurgents down in the southeast with the PKK and a, a Marxist terrorist group. Um, when there's a terrorist attack or when a country is under attack, there have to be some restrictions on media reporting. Those journalists who have contravened those restrictions, which are law, have to face the penalties of the law. Journalists cannot be above the law. If it's a, a question of a country's integrity, a country's security. But journalists are being sacked for tweeting things critical of the president or the prime minister. How has that got anything to do with anti-terrorism? There is a law on the Turkish statute books that it is against the law to, critici to criticize or uh, insult the president. This predates Erdogan. There is a law about insulting. What is insult? I mean, okay, Turkish culture doesn't accept the very harsh a light bulb swears or something to anybody. But people say Erdogan is responsible for terrorism. 
which I think is wrong. Well, there was but a million columnist who lost his job this summer. an insult to the president. So do you, think, do you think the columnist the who president. lost his job for tweeting that Erdogan is responsible for ISIS, do you think he should have lost his job? Under Turkish law? No, no. Do you think he should have lost his job? You're a journalist. I think, Would you stand no, up for your I don't think any journalist should lose their job for what they tweet or what they write. But I do think that there is a certain ethic responsibility in journalism, and we need to think about what we tweet and what we write before we write it. And if a country is fighting a terrorist organization, and losing a large number of lives. You cannot conflate. Maybe, can I give you one example? All the terrorism, though, can you? No. One example of how terrorism works in this whole thing. Daily Hurriyet, six months ago, the paper I write for, the English version, published a photo of the, a Marxist Leninist violent group that attacked a prosecutor by saying an act of terror, a horrible act of terror. Next day, Mr. Erdogan and other people in the government condemned them for terrorist propaganda, merely for publishing that photo. Then a prosecutor opened a, a case against Hurriyet for terrorist propaganda. It's like you print a photo of ISIS, you become an ISIS propagandist. This is the kind of but terrorist you propaganda need to understand. I mean, the Turkish government very well is demonizing sitting here in, these in days. In a studio in Washington and talking about that, but in Turkey, in the atmosphere in Turkey, where there are youth who are being radicalized by the PKK, and when I say radicalized by the PKK, they're not necessarily just joining the PKK. There are a lot of uh, Kurdish ethnic youths who, who are not joining the PKK but are joining ISIS in response to that. You have this kind of atmosphere. You have to be very careful about what you publish. It is no secret in Turkey today if you are not pro Erdogan, you are, there's not much life in Turkish media for you. If you're a media bus, you'll be under heavy government pressure. What you'll be probably you sacked or fired he's... from your job. That's a fact that okay, so hundreds of people are going through. Yeah, let's put the journalist to one side. Authoritarian goals, that's what you're talking about. In what way is he pursuing authoritarian goals? Can you give some examples? I'm Other not, than, like, I'm not arguing that he wants to bring Sharia or impose Islam on everybody, as some secularists mm -hmm. in Turkey are feeling. But Erdogan wants to control every aspect of Turkish life, from universities to culture to to media. And uh, people talk about a personality cult, Mustafa. There is a cult of personality, and within the AKP, it is very hard to find someone who criticizes Erdogan. And if he does that the more viciously pro Erdogan writers will declare him as a traitor, as a sellout to Zionists, and that is not a... I don't agree with you at all. I mean, well, I, I'm living I, in I, that country. I'm living, living in, in that country that as well, and I think the personality cult is being created by the opposition papers, by the opposition parties. They're the ones who are constantly talking about Erdogan. They're the ones who are constantly bringing him onto the agenda. He's the president now. His role is reduced. Yes, he comes out and he talks and he gives speeches. His role speeches. is not reduced because he doesn't I mean, actually agree with the constitutional definitions of the presidency. The constitutional issues, definitions of the presidency, he has not stepped outside of that. The, the well, talks that he has th given, There are different views about that. There's different yeah. views about that. But um, in your own words, there's, one, one, there's a consensus democracy and there's a confrontational style democracy, and Turkey is more of a confrontational style democracy, and such a democracy leads to having a strong leader. And you know as well as I do, coming from Turkey, that a strong leader is what is, desi what is desired by a large part of the population. Well, strong leaders can be great, strong leaders can be a problem. Uh, if it depends whether they're authoritarian. Do you, think he's a problem? do you think he's actually a problem? Our, some of Erdogan's actions in Turkey are a problem to our country in terms of further polarizing Mr. the nation. Here's a question to you. You say some of his actions are a problem. You've called it an authoritarian regime. Um, you're a writer in Turkey. You talked about you know, what's happening to critics and how you get ahead. Have you worried when you've written columns and hit send to your editor to have them published? Are you worried that my job might go? There might be a knock at the door? Well, my, one of my jobs went because it was not welcome in, in a pro-government newspaper. And okay, so that, already, that is something so to already, do with all this. He's already experienced it's censorship. It's the newspaper you work I'm in. If you write against the newspaper's line, I mean, if I, if I stood up and started writing, if I worked for The Guardian and I started writing very right-wing uh, well, actually, the Guardian have a couple of right-wing columns. Okay. But the but thing I mean, is, uh, okay, well, there there is, is, there is a, newspapers there is an have line. principles, yes. but a cult of personality well, let, well, let is not this, a principle. Let me put this cult of personality point to you, uh, Zainab. You said that the cult of personality is from the opposition, yes. you say. And yet, in Turkey, you have his supporters at an event welcoming him to chants of messenger of God. His birthday has been referred to on billboards as a holy birthday. One Ak minister compared his lifestyle to the Prophet Sunnah. One Ak deputy said that touching him is yes, a form of prayer. One, another, one, another, one. another. <laughs> another the ACT deputy said he has the attributes of God. If that is not a personality cult, what is a personality cult? one person cult? here, one no, person I've just quoted there, one three different, there. I've just okay, quoted three, three different ACT politicians. Those three people make a personality cult? Did he sack cult? them? He, he seems to get lots of journalists sacked. Did he sack any of these guys for comparing him to the prophet? Quite blasphemous. No, I agree the party, with Jane there was, with one there, thing. There was a reaction, and it was a very negative reaction. These kind of things we don't want to hear. People in Turkey who support Erdogan, most of them were like, what's this? This, this is not right. 
Steve President Erdogan doesn't, doesn't dismiss those people, though. He actually promotes them most of the time. So if he doesn't want the cult of personality, he can intervene. Do you intervene. have evidence that he promoted those people? Well, in the party, I know who's being promoted and who's being demoted. Erdogan critics are disappearing uh, in the last in the list, just, just How many people have been changed who were Erdogan's? I mean, it, it, that doesn't wash. I'm sorry, that's just not even true. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you both for joining me in the arena. That's our show. Up front, we'll be back next week.